Google introduces Willow, the -the state-of-the-art quantum chip. Let's look at this article by the founder and lead of Google Quantum AI. But before we do that, there's a few concepts that are important to understand. As we look at this, remember when people were saying that AI progress has hit a wall? Yeah, just, just keep that in mind as we look into this. Because from where I'm sitting, that exponential progress is seeming to get steeper and steeper. It's bigger than you can possibly imagine. Subscribe so you don't miss it. So this is Google's quantum computer. Now, in theory, there are certain problems that it could solve in five minutes that would take the greatest supercomputers that we have available today billions of years. So if you put this quantum computer versus the world's largest supercomputer, kind of the classical computer, this one might be done in five minutes while the biggest supercomputer would run for more than the current age of the universe. What makes quantum computers so fast, so amazing, so futuristic? Well, normal classical computers, the one that you and I use, they run on bits, ones and zeros. Or you can think of it as, let's say, a light switch. It can only be on or off. Quantum computers operate with qubits. By the way, there's like five different ways that I've seen this spelled. But the point is, instead of being either on or off, they exist in something called a superposition, a combination of both. So bits are deterministic. They exist in a fixed state, on or off. Qubits are probabilistic. The state that they exist in is defined by probabilities. So if you can imagine a room with a light switch inside, you can see in bits, it would be a room with the light either on or off. You can see if it's on or off and uh, no funky business. To understand what a qubit is, imagine that same room, but the door is closed. You're standing outside of it, so you can't see inside. You don't know if the light is on or off, but you know the probability of it being on or off. For example, let's say there's a 10% chance that it's on and a 90% chance that it's off. So there's a 100% chance it's one or the other. We just don't know which one it is until we look. So that room with the closed door that you can't see inside of, that's the superposition. The qubit isn't in on or off, it's sort of partially in both, and there's a certain probability for each. The reason that qubits can be so much better for computational power and speed is that with classical bits, as we add more bits, the ability of the computer, the speed and the power, it scales linearly. You double the number of bits, you double the power. One bit can represent one state. Ten bits can represent ten states. With one qubit... That one qubit represents two states at once. It represents both the on and the off state with some probability. So we're representing both of those states with one qubit. And of course, two qubits would represent four states. Ten qubits would represent over a thousand states. It scales exponentially. That means that the ability of this computer is to solve certain problems scales exponentially with each additional qubit. Now, there's a big sort of asterisk here in that this is only true for certain problems. Now, there's a lot more to unpack here, specifically with quantum entanglement and how that's used to actually do the actual computation. But the big point to understand here is that qubits are very error prone. When we're using these qubits for calculations, they have a very high error rate. So a few weeks ago, Google introduced this. So this is not the chip. This is not Willow. This is part of their sort of Google DeepMind and their AI team. They're calling it the Alpha Qubit. Alpha Qubit tackles one of quantum computing's biggest challenges. This new AI system accurately identifies errors inside quantum computers, helping to make this new technology more reliable. So the same system or a slightly modified system, the Alpha system, right, from AlphaGo, AlphaFold, Alpha Chip, etc., That's kind of the backbone of a lot of the Google DeepMind technology. In this case, it's getting used to correct these quantum errors. So AlphaQubit is this neural network that's taught to recognize when these quantum mistakes are made. It's also very scalable, very fast. We have some other sort of technologies that are accurate, but they're slow. They're impractically slow. Alpha Qubit is fast, scalable, and accurate. All right, so with all that in mind, let's get back to Willow, right? This state-of-the-art quantum chip that's just been released. So two major achievements with this Willow chip. One is that Willow can reduce errors exponentially as we scale up using more qubits. So more qubits, more processing power, exponentially less errors. This cracks a key challenge in quantum error correction that the field has pursued for almost 30 years. 
Second, and this is what I was referring to earlier, Willow performed a standard benchmark computation in under five minutes that would take one of today's fastest supercomputers 10 septillion years. So that's a number that's, that vastly exceeds the age of the universe. So kind of the big deal to understand here is uh, they achieved something that they referred to as below threshold. So with quantum computers, there's a tendency to rapidly exchange information with the environment. That's kind of like the error rate. The data is not protected. The information is not protected. And so as you're trying to achieve these computations, as you're adding more qubits, as you're trying to scale it up, that error rate goes through the roof. It becomes more and more error prone. So below threshold would be kind of the opposite. Are we able to reduce the number of errors as we increase the number of qubits? So computational power goes up, errors go down at a greater rate than is caused by increasing the computational ability. So today in Nature, Google published results showing that the more qubits we use in Willow, the more we reduce errors and the more quantum the system becomes. This historic accomplishment is known in the field as below threshold, being able to drive errors down while scaling up the number of qubits. And as the first system below threshold, this is the most convincing prototype for a scalable, logical qubit built to date. It's a strong sign that useful, very large quantum computers can indeed be built. Now, as incredible as some of this stuff is, as amazing as progress have been, it's important to understand that we're not quite at the sort of real world practical applications quite yet. So the next big step for Google and team is to demonstrate a first useful beyond classical computation on today's quantum chips that's relevant to the real world, right? So what things can we do with this that we can't do on a classical computer? Something that's useful, something that has some value to the real world. So before they run something called the RCS benchmark, so it's kind of a way to measure the performance, to benchmark the performance, but doesn't really have any known real world application. It just gives an idea of how awesome potentially this thing could be, but it doesn't really solve any useful problems. Also, they've done scientifically interesting simulations on these quantum computers, and there have been sort of useful scientific discoveries, but it's within reach of classical computers. So these highly advanced, very hard to make quantum computers, they still haven't given us anything that's unique that we, we haven't been able to do before that's also useful. But one thing that really caught my eye because it could spell some pretty big things for AI progress moving forward is this interview on Anastasia in tech. She's interviewing Mike Newman from Google Quantum AI about potentially, and get this, using these quantum computers to train AI models. So you're probably aware that there's a GPU crunch. NVIDIA's printing money like there's no tomorrow. But we are running into some potential limitations. It's just the sheer amount of like compute that is needed to power these models. And if we're going to continue scaling, there needs to be some new sort of hardware solutions. Could quantum computers be that sort of uh, quantum leap forward? Let's take a listen. In the AI models that will be too large to train on the classical hardware. I would say that the two technologies are very complementary, and there are also ways in which quantum computing uh, we expect to be able to enhance sort of AI as well. You know, some of, some of the people on my team and with collaborators showed that uh, for certain learning tasks uh, about the world around us, if you right, the world around us is fundamentally quantum mechanical, uh, and if you're running an experiment where you have quantum information, uh, using a quantum computer to learn from that data can require exponentially fewer samples, so it's exponentially more efficient than a classical AI could do. At the same time, I had a discussion with several researchers that it can happen that AI can potentially take over some of the quantum computing applications because AI, as we saw it with protein folding, right, it can find certain rules and principles and in this way reduce the scope of the problem to the problem which can be solved in the classical machine. So as I mentioned earlier, this blog post on Google was written by Partmut Nevin and he's the founder and lead of Google Quantum AI. Here's how he finishes that blog post and I think it's important. He's saying, my colleagues sometimes ask me why I left the burgeoning field of AI to focus on quantum computing. My answer is that both will prove to be the most transformational technologies of our time. But advanced AI will significantly benefit from access to quantum computing. This is why I named our lab Quantum AI. Quantum algorithms have fundamental scaling laws on their side, as we're seeing with RCS. There are similar scaling advantages for many foundational computational tasks that are essential for AI. So quantum computation will be indispensable for collecting training data that's inaccessible to classical machines training and optimizing certain learning architectures, and modeling systems where quantum effects are important. This includes helping us discover new medicines, designing more efficient batteries for electric cars, 
and accelerating progress in fusion and new energy alternatives. Many of these future game-changing applications won't be feasible on classical computers. They're waiting to be unlocked with quantum computing. So let me know what you think about that. It certainly seems like um, fun times ahead. It looks like AI is becoming more and more of a sort of a linchpin that's kind of connecting more and more different industries and frontiers. You know, not only are we using AI to improve our ability to correct errors that are coming up in this hardware and these quantum computers, but quantum computers can potentially power the next generation of AI, so these neural nets potentially making them more efficient for specific tasks where classical computing might not work at all, or at least not be able to handle the vast amounts of data that's required to produce neural nets of that size. So what do you think? Is this a big deal? Do you think that this is overhyped? Maybe while this is impressive, you don't expect to see any real world applications anytime soon. Let me know in the comments. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. My name is Wes Roth, and I'll see you next time.